Welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Lucy and the book that I am going to be reading the first chapter of today is called The First State of Being and this is by Erin and Trotta Kelly. The First State of Being is a book about an 11 year old boy named Michael Rosario and at the beginning of the book we see Michael stealing some canned peaches from a local grocery store. Though we learn as we get to know Michael that he is not really the type to steal things. This book takes place in 1999 and so it is on the cusp of turning into this new millennium and there's this fear of Y2K, this idea that when the year 2000 comes the world is basically going to stop. Michael's extremely worried about this. He lives alone with his mother and he wants to make sure that he is stockpiling enough canned goods for them for when the world sort of shuts down. The grocery store that he's stealing from is a grocery store that his mother used to work at, but she got fired for staying home to take care of him when he was sick. And now she has to work three jobs. Michael feels incredibly guilty about this and he feels responsible for this. So he's kind of an anxious, worried 11 year old. He doesn't have tons of friends. He's friends with the maintenance man in their apartment complex, which is called Fox Run Apartments. His name is Mr. Mosley. And he is also sort of friends with a girl named Gibby, who's 15 years old, and she is tasked with babysitting Michael. And she's there when Michael comes home from school on the days where he doesn't hang out with Mr. Mosley. So those are really the people in his life until he meets a boy named Ridge. And Ridge is a little strange to Gibby and Michael at first. His clothes look off. His expressions are very strange. He kind of acts like he's being followed. He just seems off to Michael. And Michael's not usually one for inserting himself into things, but there's just something there that makes him curious about Ridge. And he does start to become friends. He and Gibby start to become friends with Ridge. We learn that Ridge has traveled from the future back to 1999. And we learn more about how and why he does this as the book goes on. So this is an interesting mix of some time travel, but it's also the story about time changing. And it's also a coming of age story. So this sort of changing in your own time. I am now going to read the first chapter of The First State of Being. There's a little bit I'll read before that explains Y2K, and then I'll do the first chapter. Y2K, aka the Millennium Bug, or the year 2000 problem, refers to a worldwide panic that occurred on world as the calendar neared January 1st, 2000. At the time, it was believed that computer systems would malfunction when internal program systems reset to the year 00. Some information technology experts warned that computers would not be able to distinguish the correct meaning of 00, resulting in widespread failure of vital infrastructures. This failure was expected to cause disruptions in air travel, banking, industry, electric grids, phone systems, and other critical services necessary for daily living at the turn of the century. The Y2K scare was fueled by intense media coverage. Ultimately, however, there were very few disruptions and no disaster came to pass. Chapter one, August 17th, 1999. Peaches, Michael Rosario thought, that's what we need. His mother loved peaches. If the world came to a standstill at midnight on January 1st, 2000, at least she would have two things she cherished, peaches and Michael. He gazed at the shelves of canned fruit in Super Saver. He pulled the can from the shelf. He looked left, then right, then left again. It was early, barely 7.30 in the morning, so the place was practically empty. It was the perfect time to go grocery shopping, if you'd call it that. He slipped the peaches into the pocket of his windbreaker and felt them settle. He focused on the exit and headed in that direction. He pictured his mother huddled in the darkened hours of the new millennium, scooping a spoonful of sweet peaches into her mouth, saying, you know what, Michael, you were right about Y2K. I should have listened. Sometimes 11-year-old boys know exactly what to do. Only he wasn't 11 anymore. As of today, he was 12. And they probably wouldn't need to open the canned goods right away. They'd have to eat everything from the refrigerator first before it all went bad. The exit was right in front of him, one or two steps, and shoop, the automatic doors would slide open. Hey, hey, Mikey Mike, he froze. It's Michael, 
not Mikey Mike, he instinctively said, though he didn't say it out loud because he recognized the voice and it belonged to 19-year-old Billy Gibson, who everyone called BG. If Michael were a different person, he might have kept walking or pretended he hadn't heard, but he couldn't. Of course he couldn't, because everyone always heard BG. BG made sure of that. Michael turned. The peaches were so, so heavy. Michael felt the urge to sneeze. He was still getting over his stupid summer cold, and his eyes watered. He didn't want to move. He didn't want to sneeze. He didn't want to do anything but disappear into the ether. BG was in the produce section wearing the standard Super Saver uniform, the same kind Michael's mother had worn before she'd been fired. A cart of potatoes was parked next to him. What are you doing here so early in the morning, BG said. He picked up some potatoes and shoved them into place. Getting flowers for your mama, he snickered. Michael couldn't think of anything to say. Not a single word came to him. He pressed his right thumb into the center of his left palm. As soon as he looks at the potatoes again, I'll keep walking, he told himself. But BG didn't look at the potatoes. Instead, his gaze drifted over Michael's shoulder and landed on Jamar Prince, who was walking toward them, holding three butterfingers and a crumpled receipt. BG's expression turned serious. Jamar smiled faintly at Michael. Hey, I thought that was you, he said. You want to walk back with me? Since when did Jamar Price, who was 16 and in high school, want to walk anywhere with him? Since when did Billy Gibson work the morning shift? Since when did either of them come anywhere near the Super Saver at 7.30 a.m.? Michael was here at precisely this time because he didn't want to see anyone. And now look. Um, Michael shifted from foot to foot. BG strode over holding a pale white potato, which somewhat resembled the shape and color of his head. He narrowed his eyes at Jamar's candy bars. Did you pay for those? Jamar raised his chin. Yeah, I paid for them, he said, his voice sharp. What are you trying to say? Michael's body tensed. He felt like a blade of grass caught between two boulders. The exit was right there, a few steps away. If you paid for them, how come they're not in a bag? Said BG. What do I need a bag for? Jamar said. And I don't need to steal candy bars from this raggedy store when I have money of my own. Jamar stepped closer to Michael and nudged his shoulder. Come on, let's walk back. Keep me company. Jamar headed toward the exit. Michael followed. You better not be stealing. My father's the manager, you know, BG called after them. He was talking to Jamar, of course, even though Michael was the one with a pocket full of peaches. Jamar called BG a name under his breath, a two-syllable swear word. As he and Michael went through the automatic doors and walked towards Fox Run Apartments, where they both lived, Michael wasn't one for swearing. He heard it all the time, of course, at school, around the complex, in movies, but for whatever reason, it made him feel squirmy. Like he was doing something wrong, even though he wasn't doing anything. I wanted to make sure he wasn't giving you a hard time, Jamar said. He shoved two of the candy bars in his back pocket, ripped the third open with his teeth, and spit a piece of torn wrapper onto the ground as they crossed the street. Michael wanted desperately to pick it up so he could throw it away properly, but he didn't want to look fussy. Jamar continued, sometimes he messes with Darius. Darius was Jamar's youngest brother. Michael wasn't sure how old he was, maybe eight or nine. Jamar had another brother, Elijah, who was going into seventh grade, just like Michael. They weren't friends. They weren't enemies. They weren't anything. Darius is quiet, like you, Jamar said, his mouth full. Easy target for people, except he didn't say people. He said the swear word again. They were now on the grounds of Fox Run Apartments and Townhomes, the best community in Delaware. And Jamar veered left toward Building A, while Michael veered right toward Building J. See you around, said Jamar. Thanks, Michael said, but Jamar was already too far away to hear him. Michael didn't realize how tense he was until he saw the courtyard near his building. He took a deep breath and relaxed his shoulders. Everything looked as it should, Cars and their assigned parking spots, a stray cat, the one Michael had secretly named Tuxedo, slinking around the bushes, Mr. Mosley, the maintenance man, hefting a can of paint toward a vacant apartment. Hey, Mr. Mosley, Michael said. Mosley looked up. He had a brown, weathered face, smattered with wrinkles and folds from his forehead to his chin. But when he smiled like he was doing now, all the lines settled at the corners of his eyes. He was wearing his painting overalls with fox run stitched on the pocket. Michael! Mosley said cheerfully. He set down the can of paint. Just the man I wanted to see. He pulled out his wallet, the one with the Philadelphia Eagles logo emblazoned on the front, and slipped a crisp 
$20 bill from it. Today's your big day, if I'm not mistaken. He waved the money in Michael's direction. You don't have to give me anything, Michael said. He sneezed and wiped his nose with the back of his hand, something he'd never do if his mama were here. But Mr. Mosley didn't care about such things. Well, yeah, I don't have to. There are only two things I have to do, pay taxes and die, Mosley said, one of his favorite expressions. Actually, that makes three things, pay taxes, die, and paint 3F. He towed the paint can. Eggshell white, it said. Same color in every apartment. But for right now, I'm giving you 20 bucks. Michael wanted to take it, but he also didn't want to take it. It's one thing to shoplift because you don't have money. It's another thing to shoplift when you do. That's how Michael reconciled it anyway. Maybe I'll walk back to the Super Saver later and pay for the peaches properly, he thought, even though he knew he wouldn't. Thanks, Mr. Mosley, Michael said. He took the money. No problem. Besides... Mosley stopped mid-sentence. There was a kid, a teenager, several paces away, wandering toward them with an unusual expression on his face. He kept glancing over his shoulder like he was being followed. He looked, what, not afraid or panicked exactly, more like someone who had just committed a crime, robbed a bank, perhaps, or stolen canned goods from Super Saver. As he came closer, Michael realized how odd his clothes were. He was wearing a uniform of some kind, shirts, and pants. White, but not white. Eggshell, maybe. Like the paint. And his shoes were exactly the same eggshell color. Together, the outfit glinted strangely in the sun. Mosley stepped in front of Michael. Hey there, Mosley said. Can I help you? The teenager seemed startled that Mosley was speaking to him, even though Mosley and Michael had been watching him the whole time, and vice versa. Hello, the teenager said. He looked like he could be half Filipino, like Michael, he stopped on the sidewalk a few steps in front of them and cleared his throat. <clears> throat. What's up? You need help with something, Mosley said. No, I mean, yes, he paused. My name is Ridge. It's a pleasure to meet you. Mosley ignored the introduction. You need help with something? Could you tell me the date, Ridge said. It's August 17th, Michael said quietly. Thank you, Ridge said. He glanced over his shoulder. Of what year? Michael glanced at Mosley. What kind of person didn't know what year it was? It's 1999, Mosley replied, more of a question than a statement. Ridge repeated the year under his breath. The expression on his face changed. Excitement or fear, Michael couldn't tell which. You live here at Fox Run, Mosley said. Never seen you around before. Ridge didn't answer. He was chewing his bottom lip like he was trying to solve a complex math equation. Did you hear me, kid, Mosley asked. Yes, I mean, yeah. Ridge replied, walking backward like he couldn't wait to get away from them. I do. I live right around here. He waved in a general direction that didn't mean anything. Then he turned on his heel. Thanks for your help. Peace out. Mosley and Michael watched him disappear behind building F. Well, that was weird, Mosley said. He picked up the paint can. Better keep an eye on that kid if we see him around again. He's up to something. He punched Michael playfully on the shoulder. Then again, we're all up to something in our way. Right, Michael? Yeah, Michael said, thinking about his pocket full of peaches. We're all up to something. That is the end of chapter one of The First State of Being. Some of the chapters in this book are third person narration, but from Michael's point of view, like the one we just heard. And then there are these other chapters interspersed throughout that we are hearing about from the future. And it's from Ridge's mother and Ridge's brothers. And they are told to us in more of a transcription form, like an email or a text almost, rather than just a straight narrative. And it's through those that we start to learn how Ridge left the future and why he did, and learn a little bit more about what it's going to be like for him being in the past. And then with the chapters where it's really Michael's point of view, we're seeing Ridge existing in the time that the book is taking place in. And we get a little bit of how Ridge is perceived from Michael and from Gibby and from Mr. Mosley. The book has a little bit of a mystery element because throughout you're trying to figure out with Michael why Ridge came, but then you also know a little bit more than Michael. So it's an interesting setup and a very interesting premise and it's really well done. All the characters are really interesting and quirky and it's funny at times you got a little of that humor in the first chapter but it also has a nostalgic feel that i really enjoyed i recommend the first state of being by aaron and Trada kelly thank you for joining me